All right, before we get uh, to Los Angeles in uh, 1984, I want to uh, talk just briefly about Sochi, uh, for which I leave on Thursday. I want to give you a little news update here. Uh, Katie Hansen, who is 21 years old and a, uh, a luge athlete from that noted hotbed of uh, La Cañada, California, uh, won a, uh, a race today in uh, Lafia. It is the first U.S. World Cup singles victory since 1997. Yo. Uh, Bodie Miller finished third in the downhill today in Kitzbühel, so, and he would have, could have, should have won the race, but, but for one mistake, so he is on form heading to Sochi. And at the X Games in Aspen, David Wise, who was last year's FIS World Cup champion, won his third consecutive gold medal in the Men's Ski Superpipe Friday. Why do you care? That is the, that is the uh, action sports thing that Mark was talking about. Watch him and a guy named um, uh, Mr. Uh, Nate Gepper. Um, uh, he has the first three piece since uh, Tanner Hall did it from 2006 to 2008. Thanks to, I want you to listen to these words. Huge amplitude and big spins like a switch right side 900 and a switch double cork right side 1260. What do those things mean? Can anybody tell me? Yes. Right, okay. That's exactly right. What does switch mean? If you don't learn anything else today from me, I want you to learn what switch means. Switch means taking off backwards. Backwards, exactly right. So when you hear these dudes talking from Sochi about what switch means, switch means backwards. So when you go home today, you go, I actually learned something today. <laughs> okay? Amplitude means what? How high you go. That means big air. Okay? And a cork is an off axis rotation. <laughs> Okay, I've just explained the whole thing to you. Now you can sound like you know what you're talking about when you watch all this stuff from Sochi. It's the same for, for, for ski and snowboarding. It's the exact same stuff. So here's why this stuff is important for the American ski team, okay? In Vancouver, there were 24 medal opportunities in free ski and snowboard. In Sochi, there are gonna be 48, okay? The US ski team is very, very good at this stuff. Okay. <laughs> Okay, that's what they pay me the not big bucks to know this kind of stuff. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's go back to the 1984 games. I actually totally and profoundly agree with Mark. Whether or not you agree with a lot of stuff about the Olympic Games, probably the seminal moment for the Olympics was when Rafer lit the torch. Lit Rafer, when Rafer, lit Rafer lit the cauldron, excuse me. Why? Because the Olympic movement was in turmoil. There were uh, massacres, there were boycotts, there was everything. And my premise is that also the golden moment of Los Angeles, uh, the golden years of Los Angeles, were from the start of the Olympic Games until Rodney King had his moment on the side of the road. So, um, Barry, David, Anita, let's start by saying, tell me, what were your roles, each of you, uh, at the LAOC? And also, what were your favorite stories or memories from 1984? And ladies and gentlemen, this is not a, we're gonna sit up here and talk. If you have questions or comments or whatever, feel free to raise your hands and weigh in. I, I don't have any I, monopoly on good ideas, please. Anita, you wanna start, please? Okay, in 1984, I was responsible for, during the time of the games, I was responsible for the village at USC, uh, which housed, um, Let's see, 4,000 athletes. We had planned to hold, hold more than that, but with the boycott, some of the housing assignments were changed. Um, and not only were the athletes there, but we also had uh, a venue almost, well, sort of inside the village, the swim stadium, which hosted swimming and diving um, throughout the games, was right there on the corner where it's, the pool is still there. Imagine uh, stands that held, uh, I think, 18,000 people around that little place. Now the, the structures are still there too. Now there's a building there, so it's harder to imagine where the, the stands were. Uh, similarly, we were uh, across the street, essentially from the Coliseum and the boxing venue. So it was a, an area of a great deal of, of uh, structure. Leading up to the games, though, I was responsible for whatever Peter or Harry said I was responsible for. It's the way we worked. <laughs> 
and uh, I was responsible at one moment after the boycott was announced for getting all the National Olympic Committees from Africa to the Games, and we were successful in having all but uh, three, actually all but two came. Libya came and then uh, left when it was determined that their journalists, who they demanded be let in the country, were coming to create news, not to report it, and they were not allowed in, so unfortunately the Libyan athletes went home um, the day of opening ceremonies, I think. Um, so that's what I was up to. Well, uh, my job at the Olympics was primarily being responsible for governmental relations. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, I was one of the first handful of employees that was hired, meaning I was there for almost six years. And for those of us who were there that long, which includes the people on either side of me, when you ask about my memories or our memories of the Olympics, it's really not so much what happened during the two weeks of the Games, but we have all these years of memories to draw on, which uh, was exciting and different almost every day. So uh, I'll, I'll tell you a story from the beginning and the end of the Games. Uh, beginning of the Games, when the Games Organizing Committee first started, you know, now it's easy to look back. It was tremendously successful, uh, it was rewarding, it was exciting, and all those good things. But when the Games were awarded to Los Angeles, the atmosphere was uh, somewhat toxic for people involved with the Olympics. Because the Games had been awarded here under a, a lot of concern that they would wind up bankrupting the city or costing the taxpayers huge amounts of money, as had happened at the most recent Games in Montreal. Because the 76 Montreal Games were just a year before the Los Angeles bid for 84 began. And without taking you through a, a long song and dance, it was really a very tortured path to get the Olympics here. Um, I guess you alluded to that with your eight votes. Uh, but uh, as one of the first few employees at the Olympics, I was excited about my job. I was proud to be working on this unique project. Uh, and I quickly learned that that was something that I really should not talk about much outside the office. Because you went to parties, you went to social events, you went to receptions, and if someone knew you worked for the Olympics, you would find yourself pinned to the wall with someone jabbing their finger and holding a drink in their hand and saying, this is going to bankrupt the city and why are you doing this and so forth and so on. Uh, so it was not until years later that it, people became excited and the excitement started to build. So I just wanted to convey that this was not um, you know, a victory parade the entire way. Uh, it was tough going in the early years. But the Rafer Johnson story, which Alan alluded to, just the backstory of Rafer lighting the torch, for those of you who aren't familiar with the details, is really interesting because Rafer was on the board of the organizing committee, was involved in the planning. He was, uh, was and is a stellar Olympian. Uh, you're going to be hard pressed to meet a, a better all around person than Rafer. And Peter Uberoth and David Walper, who produced the opening ceremonies, privately met with Rafer about 10 days before and said, you're the person we've chosen to light the torch. Rafer was overwhelmed, honored, went home and started training because he hadn't been in you know, Olympian shape for something like this. And you'll recall that he had to run up all the stairs of the stadium. And when he got to the top stair of the Coliseum, there was an auxiliary staircase that went like this and elevated in order to get him close enough to be able to light the device which connected the cauldron on top. <laughs> And Rafer had stairs in his house, and he was jogging up and down the stairs, and he was, he was going out, and they took him out to the Coliseum at 4 in the morning when no one was there so he could practice. And within a few days, Rafer developed shin splints, and he could no longer run up the stairs. And they told him, David Walper said, look, you go home, you don't do anything between now and the opening ceremony, because you've got to be able to do this. Uh, and on the day of the opening ceremony, it was so uncertain whether he could perform that Bruce Jenner was standing by in his street clothes a few feet from where Rafer took the final torch. And had he been asked, he would have peeled off his street clothes Superman style to reveal the identical uniform that Rafer was wearing. Uh, and a, corre a correction is coming, I can tell. Uh, just to add that uh, that threat was known to Rafer, and there's no way on earth he was going to let. <laughs> <laughs> Given the Kardashian saga now, it's a good thing things worked out the way they did, right? Yeah. So uh, the only other thing to add, obviously, Rafer successfully lit the torch, and it was a, a great experience for the city and for him. But when he got to the top of the, uh, the second stairway, the auxiliary stairway, and he did have the one rehearsal that he had before he got the shin splints, when he got to the top, he realized that he was terrified by the fact that after climbing all these stairs, 
he was basically standing out, nothing to hold on to, no railing, uh, and uh, he just thought, wow, I'm really up here. And, and he said to David Wolper, you got to give me something to hang on to. And they built a pole that was waist high, which he could grab. And he told me later that he said that uh, it's one thing to run up the stairs. He could handle that. But he said what he hadn't reckoned on was he turned around to hold the torch, and now he sees 100,000 people in front of him and all 8,000 athletes filling the field. He said it was so overwhelming that had he not had that device to hang on to, he said he thinks he would have fallen over backwards. So uh, opening ceremonies always have their share of great stories. I've heard that story before, too. He says he's way more nervous doing that than he ever was competing in the decathlon in 1960, for which he won the gold medal, and 1956, for which he won the silver medal. Can you imagine? Wow, huh? I uh, was never an employee of the uh, Los Angeles Olympic Organizing Committee. I was their outside uh, general counsel. Uh, there was no actual inside uh, general counsel until uh, Carol came along several years ago, like 1982, or maybe 83. Uh, so that my role was to negotiate the deals. And there was an Olympian number of deals, because normally the Olympic Games are put on by a government. And if the government, the government owns its police force, and the government owns its stadiums in most countries, and they just say, do it there. But we had to negotiate for everything from the Coliseum to the police to the balloon man. Uh, so there was lots to do. It began, in answer to your question, uh, at the very beginning, as they say. Uh, and the um, <coughs> Los Angeles Olympic Organizing Committee had won the bid before hiring Peter Ubroth. They hired Peter after they'd secured the bid in early 1979. And my law firm, Latham & Watkins, which is a corporate law firm, had uh, obtained the tax exemption from the IRS. So we were already there just for that limited role. And then suddenly, in early summer of 1979, before the, well before the Moscow Games occurred, uh, we had our first sponsorship deal, the Coca-Cola deal. The entire 100 or almost 200 sponsors in Montreal had yielded $6 million in cash collectively. This deal we negotiated, Peter negotiated, yielded $12 million in cash, plus a lot of Coca-Cola that they valued for another $20 million, which <laughs> you can take it or leave it. Uh, so he needed someone who could help him negotiate this license. In those days, very different from today, large corporate law firms did not do licensing, generally speaking. That was for patent law firms. The only person who did licensing was the international guy, and that was always my beat. I was the person who headed international transactions at Latham and Watkins, and you did, it, you did licensing, unlike all your colleagues, because in those days, unlike today, there were exchange controls. Uh, they exist only in a few countries, such as Argentina now. <laughs> and one way, if you invested abroad, you could get your money out was by giving the person with whom you invested a license and then taking out a royalty. So in my world, you had to know licensing. This was a worldwide license. So Peter came to see me. We negotiated that deal, and then the Anheuser-Busch deal for the beer, and then the television deal, which was up to that date the largest television deal of any kind in history for $225 million. And we formed a fast relationship. And I just continued to do deals, along with my colleagues at Latham & Watkins. So that's what I did, and continued to do it right up to the right up to the end. Mm -hmm. Anita, what's your favorite memory from 1984? I don't think I have one. There were so many. There was the morning when I was called by my staff in the, during the village time uh, and saying that there was a problem with, uh, I will not name the, the country, uh, of the runners because they were um, running on the freeway. And uh, <laughs> we had the day before advised them that in Los Angeles, people pay attention to pedestrians. So it was really messing up traffic for the runners to be running through the city and stopping traffic as the cars would stop, not to hit the runners. So they had cleverly decided, well, OK, you know, stop lights out here, so we'll just run on the freeway. <laughs> I said, well, OK, yeah, pull them over the next off ramp and just tell them to come back to the village and we'll talk. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? Well, they were then there the was the yeah. Well, they were running on the ten. That was very pleasant. <laughs> it wasn't too busy then. You'll recall. Um, 
And then there was a time when uh, we, although we had shifted some of the athletes to U UCLA, which was the other village, the village at USC was for the rowers and the kayakers and canoers because their venue was at Lake Casitas. Uh, so the two villages were SC and UCLA. Uh, when we began to be overloaded, um, this is where you learn to delegate, we had the SWAT teams in some of the housing inside the village. We had, we had these silly, was anyone here a blue beret? Okay, good, I can say we had these silly uh, <laughs> uniforms and the security guards wore blue berets because we didn't want to look like an armed camp. But we had SWAT teams inside the village but I delegated to my, my second in command to tell the SWAT team that they had to move out because we had to put athletes where they were. And that was a, a little bit of a tense moment, but I let someone else do the hard work there. <laughs> um, when I first started writing about the Olympics, it was uh, late 1998, and I'm forever grateful to all three of these people and many uh, other people in this room. Uh, one of them is Rich Perlman. Rich, if I could ask you to stand up for a second. <clears throat> Um, Rich, one more time. Uh, I want you to stand up and, and explain to people why Olympic Boulevard in Los Angeles is named Olympic Boulevard. <laughs> That's to do with the I realize that. It had to do with the 1932 game. Exactly. And the 1932 organizing committee, which, depending on how you look at it, also turned to surplus, had a cash surplus when it was done. Uh, William A. Garland's committee renamed 4th Avenue uh, Olympic Boulevard. 10th. 10th. 10th Avenue. 10th. It was. Permanent because it came before 1950, uh, which is when the current U.S. Uh, U current federal law uh, gives the U.S. Olympic Committee complete rights to the name, the word Olympic. 19 the word in English language. 1978. Uh, 1978, but everything before 1950 was grandfathered, which means that the SECOG actually owns the rights to the 32 rings, still does, and our Olympic Boulevard can never be taken. Right. And it was the 10th Olympic That's Games. Right. I want to add just a correction. Because of the 10th and the big games, right. there's 9th Street to the north and 11th Street to the south. That's right. So that was why they went on 10th Street for the games. And I don't know if I'm going to get in trouble, but we do have a police station called the Olympic Division. And I didn't ask anybody for permission. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now a, a broader question. Um, I'll ask the panel first, and if anybody else has any other suggestions, please weigh in. You, you know, in journalism, uh, you learn in journalism school to ask super easy, obvious questions, some of which don't have easy answers, but I'll ask. What do you think is the greatest contribution the 1984 Games made to the city of Los Angeles or to Southern California? Anita. Well, I was an immigrant. I moved here in 1981 uh, to work for the organizing committee. I had been on the board of directors prior to that because the USOC had, that was probably one of your first contracts, Barry. The, oh, no, because that was before Peter came on board. Uh, the USOC had a contract with the, uh, with the Los Angeles Olympic Organizing Committee because the USOC, with $5 million in illiquid assets, was a financial guarantor of the 1984 Olympic Games. The city wouldn't do it. Someone had to do it. So it, it fell to the USOC to sign the contract and say that. Therefore, we had a certain number of board members, and the USOC had a policy that in any policy-making group, there had to be, a, 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 I think it was 10, 20 percent athlete representation. So I was one of the athletes who was put on the LAOC board of directors. Um, and they eventually, uh, Peter and Harry, I thought they were just being nice to me after 1980. And they said, why don't you come out and work? And then I said, why don't I? And I came out here. So I didn't know what the city was, really. I had come to a couple of board meetings. And I didn't realize until people kept saying during the time of the games that was the first time it felt like one community. So the bringing together of all the cities and all the areas into being one Los Angeles seemed to me as an outsider coming in to be the, 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 the biggest uh, gift to the city, other than, of course, this institution, which exists. Uh, I hate to agree. Not that, I, not that I need I don't agree on a lot, but it sounds like giving, I should give a different answer to the question. But I, I would have the same answer. I think the unifying force of the Olympics 
was something that has never been experienced in Los Angeles before or since. And when I say Los Angeles, I'm really referring to the area of the Olympics, which ran from Santa Barbara to northern San Diego County. And by a few days into the games, everybody was caught up in it and excited about it. And you were hard pressed to find any naysayers anymore. And it was the way people, it made people feel. And if anybody was here at that time, that's the first thing they think about. For all the greatness of this institution, the financial legacy, uh, the performance of the American team, all those things were great. But I think in the end, it's people remember how it made them feel, and they'd like to recapture that. Of course, that, that is absolutely true. And the, it's not just that the games did that. It's that this city needed that and needs it always not just needs it at any particular low point or something. This, is, this city is a great social experiment. It's a social experiment in whether so many people from so many places who are so different from each other can live in harmony in one place. We don't always prove that we can, but most of the time the city does it. This event and other events that are large events are what this city needs to be able to constantly not just recapture the spirit of it or the memory of it, but to recapture that sense of community. Uh, so you don't just see it in the 84 games, though that was the quintessence of it. You could see it when the shuttle lands to go and be driven at a mile an hour across the city, and you look at the reaction. Even that stupid rock we brought to the museum, <laughs> that brings out something that the people of this city feel they need, and they do need it. You don't need it in Pittsburgh. You need it here. This delivered it. It's true, uh, as, as, you, as you said, Alan, that 1992 sort of brought to an abrupt end that era of good feeling that this particular event delivered. But it delivered it for a long time, and then the constant recurrence of such things brings it back and sustains it. This is the driving force, not knee-jerk reaction, but this is what's the driving force to our constantly bidding and why we bid for 2024. Because it's something that this city not just thrives on, but absolutely requires. And when we do it right, we are a beacon to the rest of the world that it can be done. Well, we'll get to 2024, believe me. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Mark, in particular, an idea that uh, is inchoate in my mind, but um, one I've tried to frame up. I wonder whether um, 1984 was a signal. I, I grew up in the Midwest and have lived in California now for 31, going on 32 years. Uh, I, I wonder whether 1984 didn't do, I agree with everything that the three of you have said, but I wonder whether 1984 wasn't even something bigger. Mm -hmm. I wonder whether 1984 didn't um, signal a fundamental shift in the way um, the, California and Los Angeles <coughs> think of ourselves and in the way the United States is thinks of itself. You know, our country's history started from the east and moved, moved west. I wonder, you know, my children are now 19, 17, and 14. Their history is looking across the Pacific Ocean rather than east. Mm -hmm. And I wonder whether 1984 really is the start of that. You know? Go ahead. Well, I think it's, it's broader than even what you're what you're saying, though what you're saying is true. Uh, many cities, when they bid for the Olympics, usually when countries are bidding for the Olympics, uh, they want to reestablish an, an image, a brand of their country. Uh, certainly the Los Angeles brand changed after 84, as it's seen and understood around the world, not just around the country. There's always been, there will always be people who, uh, for probably looking at today's weather and other reasons, uh, out of envy, uh, are willing to say all sorts of nasty things about us. But there's no question that this city became a big league city in the minds of the world like this. Uh, at that moment and has remained so even through thick and thin ever since. Uh, yeah, since I came from Midwest and points further east, I came here believing in the California promise. You know, there was this thing about California um, and it, it came true as far as I was concerned to come here. I, I didn't know, I knew two people here when I moved uh, from uh, Princeton out here. 
And uh, yet, and that, you know, that's the way to, to live, to move to LA, because you meet a lot of people really fast when you're working for an organizing committee. And it was a great gift to be able to meet so many people that way. But uh, it's funny, I guess if you live here, it's completely different. But for someone coming from the outside in, I viewed it as fulfilling the promise that I had grown up believing in. Uh, you know, go go to LA and it's this magical place, and they'll they'll let you come and you can do what you can do and be a part of it. Right. Magical, yes, and the epitome of the American dream in many ways, but not big league. Okay. Not big league. But, but I think I that's what I think that's what I think that's what these gains establish Los Angeles as as not only a rival but an equal rival to New York in every single way. But LA didn't make a big deal about it. You know, our logo didn't say Los Angeles. It's one of the few logos that doesn't state the city on it. Right. Didn't need Is to. that our arrogance? I say our now. I'm an Agilino now. Of course, of course you're, <laughs> just like I am, entitled to be. You know? Um, before I move on to my next question or two, does anybody have any questions from the floor? I absolutely invite them. Yes, please. I think what strikes me as much as what you were able to accomplish was the ages at which you did that. Your, the organizing committee was charged with this monumental task, and I, I believe that kind of the heart of it was a, very, a bunch of very young, relatively unknown, sort of hungry people. And you think you did what you did because of your age, or despite of your age, or can I just ask about that? Well, it's funny you should mention by coincidence we were the same ages as Alan's kids, 19, 17, and 14. <laughs> 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 Well, I'm going to say something as a joke. You, you know, with all due respect to my friends in Japan who just announced their organizing committee this week, and the chairman of the organizing committee is 76, and his, and his peers are in their 70s also, that is not the norm. That is totally not. The Olympics is a young person's game. I give the floor to you. Uh, I think what drove it in part was Peter Ubroth coming in as the president of the first ever private organizing committee, he brought a business perspective to it. He also did not have a lot of cash to work with at the beginning. And to the extent he did, after Coca-Cola and other contracts were signed, he wanted to conserve that cash for the uncertainty of how much would be needed years later for the games. So what that meant was he needed to develop a core of people who were young enough to be able to afford to come to work for the organizing committee. Uh, and uh, that was not true, of course, in every case. But I think that was why uh, a lot of the people who headed up departments were relatively young. But it, it worked. Also, we didn't know what we were doing. Uh, we did not have the guidance of previous games. We could not look at uh, the reports from Moscow, which were in Russian. We couldn't look at the reports from Montreal, which were in French, by the way. Um, and so uh, we went to get some. Uh, so someone's sent the group to Montreal to pick up the reports and they brought them back. I was like, oh, this is not helpful. They're in French. Now what do we do? Of course, nobody thought to go to UCLA or SC and say, does anyone here speak French? Why bother? Uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't so young. So. I was a 38-year-old partner in a corporate law firm doing for this client what I was doing for others. So it wasn't true across the board. But the, jar, but the people on the team employed at the, at the, uh, at the committee really were very dynamic young group of people. And the leader, Peter was exactly the perfect leader. Absolutely the perfect leader. He, he rallied the troops, he put fear in some people's hearts. Those of us who had coaches who were like, they were like, oh, yeah, right, okay. Um, we know that he just expects us to perform well at a high level all the time. But there was a, 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 an esprit de corps among the staff that we were doing something really special, that we had to succeed. There was no two ways about it. We had to succeed and we had to leave a tiny little surplus because that would go back to sport. We were, at least I was well aware, maybe because I was from the USOC, that any surplus would endure, endure to the benefit of the US Olympic team. And this is back when you got nothing from the USOC except uh, the uniforms. And in my case, we didn't even get uniforms because they ran out before the women's rowing team got their uniforms in 76. It took me a year to get every member of the team because I became the captain. It was my responsibility to get everyone everything that they were supposed to get. So the USOC was a new group and uh, they needed help and we had just done this horrible thing of keeping our athletes home and trying to destroy. 
if you look at the papers from uh, the Carter presidency, you'll find that the at presidency tried to destroy the Olympic movement, tried to destroy the ILC. They failed, thank goodness. Um, but there was a real anger about what wasn't happening at the behest of President Carter. Um, and, you know, it's, thank goodness it's too powerful. But uh, so the USOC was in bad shape. So I wanted to make sure we were successful. And I think everyone there were determined to be successful. Yes. Hi. Um, I hail from a little place called Baden, Ontario, which is about an hour from Toronto, and I have no acute knowledge in the naming of Olympic Boulevard. And I maybe should have raised this earlier, but I think as a possible point of clarification, Mr. Perlman raised 1950 as a critical year. And, and actually, I think he's probably right on that. It's 49. Because it was in that year that the American Olympic Association reclaimed use, for the first time at least, of Olympic terms, marks, and logos, and dispossessed Paul Helms and the Helms Bakery of whatever commercial use they had had of the, the same marks and emblems and logos since the LA first edition games. So while the 1978 Amateur Sports Act is absolutely critical to the United States Olympic Committee and its revenue streams today, I think Mr. Cormick's right in terms of his citing 1950 as a critical year. I, again, I have no acute knowledge of Olympic Boulevard, but I think its use in the year 1950 is correct. And that was the first federal legislation. Yes, that's right. That's Mr. Perlman is a complete factotum, and if he says it, it is true. It is true. <laughs> I, I absolutely agree. Thank you. You go to the old Helms Bakery uh, oh, it was 49. facility today and see the Olympics <laughs> red signs. Yes. If, if, Rich, if Rich says it, you may bow down at yeah. his feet, and it is true. Um, Alan, if I may, you know, I, I see in the audience several people who were on the staff of the organizing committee, the permanent staff, you know, sure. Sherry, Wayne, I may be missing some. Could I ask everybody who was on the staff of the committee, please stand up and be recognized? Please. Alan, ask about Tom Bradley. I was going to ask about Peter and then Tom. Um, all, all four of us... Uh, uh, know uh, Peter very, very well. Um, you know, for those of you who only know Peter the legend, um, you know, who know it's Peter's way or the highway or uh, Peter this or Peter that, um, what's your take on Peter U. Roth then and now? You go well, uh, he's, he's certainly mellowed today. You know, he's, <laughs> I mean, he's, uh, you know, he's, he's in his late 70s you think? now, so yeah. So I saw I, him last week, you think? Well, I, I saw him last month, and so I, you know, so, I, so he's, he's not, uh, I, I don't think he wants to uh, run an organizing committee anytime soon uh, again. But I agree, Anita's saying, you know, he was the perfect leader at the time. I think that was absolutely right. Uh, he was the right person at the right time for the Olympic movement and for the Los Angeles Games. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's hard to overstate his contribution. Uh, both organizationally and financially. Um, my relationship with him was uh, a little bit different perhaps than most at the organizing committee because <coughs> he had very little experience with government and I was hired to run the governmental affairs department which dealt with the committee's interface with city, county, state and federal government to an extent it overlapped international relations because you had you know customs, state department and things of that kind uh, and it was interesting um, department because it hadn't existed at any other Olympics because the other Olympics were run by the government. If you're running thing, if you're the government, you don't need to have governmental relations department. Uh, so, but Peter, coming from the private sector, was very resistant to why we even needed a governmental affairs department. This was something that he put a very low priority on. Uh, and I would say my relationship with him looking back was a, a mutual process of education where he was educating me about the private sector and my background which had been to that point uh, in government. Um, uh, I was educating him about how government worked and why we needed each other. Uh, and eventually we came to a really good understanding on that. Uh, probably, uh, yes, you had a comment or question? I uh, wanted a further question for you, which is sort of coming from that. <coughs> Could you say more about the relationship Uh, how much time do you have? <laughs> well, I'll come. I'll, I'll, I wasn't I'll, no, no, no. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll come back. Um, one of the most interesting experiences for me with Peter was uh, about two years into the job, meaning about 1981, three years before the games. 
uh, we moved into a new office building at uh, UCLA and it had a, a small lunchroom on the top floor and we used that to not only for staff functions but also to host various people coming through whether they're from another Olympic committee or sports federation or somebody from Washington and I suggested to Peter that we should use this as a way for him to get better acquainted with local elected officials. So we had a parade coming through there of you know, the county supervisors and city council members at the time. And what I remember distinctly about that six month period was that as he was getting acquainted with them, he was getting better known in the community and was surpassing them in visibility as a public figure. Uh, and that was just very interesting to watch as the dynamic shifted uh, from you know, the, the council and other elected bodies uh, wanting stuff from Peter to the point where Peter had the leverage in those in those relationships to a great extent. So uh, uh, the relationships each of us have had with Peter are different based on how how we related to him. Of course, uh, at first, as I explained to you, he was a client of mine. But then, after the Olympics, our our friendship uh, continued. And after the 1992 uh, riots in Los Angeles. Uh, we formed Rebuild LA, and Peter and I were the first two co-chairmen of that. And we added two other co-chairs as we went on. And June Burke worked with me throughout that. So for a year and a half, Peter and I actually shared the same room, not just the same, the same offices, two desks in the same room. Uh, and I came to know him very well, and of course still do. And I, you wouldn't do that if this were not a person whom you admired and had confidence in. Uh, both as to his ability and his sense of purpose and his sense of ethics. And I still have those views. I've always maintained them. To understand him, though, as with any really superb leader, is to try to understand a very complex person. Uh, he has gifts as a leader. And that key gift for anyone is to have an intuitive understanding of other people's personalities, what it is that drives them in a group, and then as individuals. So when he's working with people who are his employees, he would know always, unfailingly, whether he should be praising them or criticizing them. What are just the right words to get them to behave just the way he and the organization needed? He has a remarkable intuitive gift for that. He also has an intuitive gift for understanding things without a tremendous need for deep exploration so that he's had remarkable success, enormous success as an investor. Doubletree and Hilton and all sorts of properties through his company, which he calls Contrarian, uh, in, in mostly the um, uh, travel and hospitality world. Uh, that kind of success isn't just luck. Uh, he's a man who started without, without anything, really. He was, he was an employee for uh, uh, Kirk, uh, um, Kirkorian. Kirkorian, and uh, running his charter airline uh, off in Hawaii. He built a whole empire before he became uh, the president of LAOC, and then he rebuilt again. Uh, so this is an extraordinarily talented man. Anita? Oh, more, more than I've already said of praise. And, um, <laughs> Uh, my relations were different. I think he was wary of me because of the position I took in 1980, and he wasn't sure what I would do. Um, but he did reach out after I had sent, actually David told me the story of, of uh, the letter. I was this pathetically poor athlete in uh, trying to figure out what I was going to do since my goal in life had been to compete at the 80 games and then get on with being perhaps a Supreme Court justice or something like that. You know. Um, but that had been completely disrupted. And uh, so I was back in Princeton, and I was uh, coaching and uh, being pre-law advisor and doing stuff for the university and trying to figure out what was next. And, um, but as a board member, I would write you know, what I thought should go on. And I remember I had only a pencil and a piece of paper that I wrote this note to, <laughs> to him saying that I thought that the youth sports program should be different than it was because it was based on people being successful, and the point of, uh, of having a period of time leading up to the games was that you could get better and better and better, and I thought that that principle was a better one for the youth to be aspiring to instead of seeing who was the best in the, like in the academic decathlon, and, um, and, and I guess that's why he decided I should come and work. 
Um, Tom brings up a good point. Now, the, the other person who made this happen along with Peter is, of course, the mayor. Yeah, absolutely. So your memories of, of Mayor Bradley? I just res had a, a tremendous respect. He and the mayor of New York came to the USOC meeting, which was at um, um, Lake Tahoe. Uh, we were meeting, and the athletes were there, and that's where we voted, uh, decided whether it should be New York or Los Angeles. And New York was just either about to be more deeply into um, um, uh, bankruptcy as a city or was coming out. I forget exactly what was happening then. But the presentation of the two mayors was remarkably different. Of course, Mayor Bradley had all of himself there and uh, knew and understood and spoke about what would be provided for the athletes there. So he won the day of the vote of the athletes, I'm sure, with except, except one person who probably voted for New York. Uh, was really for Los Angeles, and that's when I first met him, and so it, it, it remained one of just absolute respect. As he was absolutely the leader of the city, and he knew how to portray the city and the goals of, of the bid and how they would be portrayed internationally. So just absolutely, and my parents also respected him. So. <laughs> I have nothing but good memories of Tom Bradley and also City Council President John Ferraro, uh, at, who was at the time of the games. Uh, there were no bigger friends of the Olympics in LA. Uh, Tom Bradley in particular had a, a great ability, uh, no matter what the setting, to say the right thing when he was in front of a microphone or in front of an audience. So whenever I saw him, whether he was at one of our events or at someone else's, he just always seemed to hit the right note and knew when to stop talking without going on too long. Uh, he also, um, uh, I found him to be uh, a down-to-earth individual, uh, did not at all uh, put on airs as mayor. And one of the things that um, was distinctive was that he always made his own phone calls. So if I needed him, which wasn't that often, because usually it would be Peter or someone else needing to talk to him personally, but when I needed him, I was often surprised that I'd get a call at home at night, and it would be, hi, this is Tom Bradley. Um, and he'd, uh, that was the way he operated. Um, he also probably had the biggest hand for a handshake of anyone that I ever have met in my life, and I think I'll always remember that. Well, I certainly haven't lived the entire history of Los Angeles, but there could not be, and there could not have been, a greater mayor in the history of the city than Tom Bradley, uh, for all the reasons you've heard, but also for his governance and for what happened in the city through that incredible period of growth. The terrible tragedy is the way his term ended. And I remember that day that Peter and I did go to see him in his office and Pete Wilson while the riots were still going on and the city was burning. And he was dissolved in tears. Well, that's a tough segue, thanks. <laughs> um, uh, I want to switch back just to the, uh, the sport and the competition here at the games. You, you know, um, one of the other transcendent things that the 1984 games brought us that we in 2014 hardly even think about now, but the 2014 games do give us the opportunity because of the introduction of women's ski jumping is the role of women uh, in the modern Olympics. Um, we can hardly remember uh, that, you know, the women's marathon was run for the first time in 1984. Uh, and yet, there's Joan Benoit running the game, running the marathon. Um, there are so many things that the 1984 games brought us. Anita, when you think back about, uh, you have been, uh, everyone in this room uh, needs to understand the amazing job that Anita DeFrancis John has done over the years in championing the role of women in the Olympic movement. Mm -hmm. not just on the playing field at which we are moving toward equality on the playing field, but more importantly now in the executive suite where we are lagging way behind, way behind. Uh, not for lack of her efforts and the, lack, uh, and the role of other good-minded people, but uh, there's a long way to go. How significant was it you know, to see Joan run that race and and the introduction of other, other events in, in Los Angeles in 1984, Anita? Well, first, let me give credit to Jacqueline Hansen, who was a part of insisting that uh, the marathon be run for women uh, here in Los Angeles. Jacqueline, thank you for your role in that.
And as always, there has to be someone who's willing to take a risk and to put someone on the spot. And uh, I'm not sure that, you know, one thing about, we know a lot about Peter, and one thing about Peter is, I mean, he would recognize that it was logical, but it would not have been a thought in his mind that, oh gosh, we have to make sure the women run the marathon. When it came to his attention, it's like, uh-oh, okay, we gotta get this right. Uh, because that's messed up, that's not the case, but um, it, it, it was, it, I grew up in a family where you were taught if you think something's wrong, you need to do something about it. So I thought it was wrong that I didn't get to take part in sports until I was in college, um, but I couldn't do anything about that. Um, and uh, I thought it was wrong that we didn't have uniforms when we got to the, because back then, remember, you couldn't buy anything with Olympic or the rings on it. The only way you got it was to be a member of the Olympic team. So the, the fact that they didn't have uniforms for us was a, it sounds petty, but it was a crisis, you know? Were we really Olympians if we didn't have the uniforms? And how bad would that be embarrassing? Anyway, um, it, the other thing about living in that village, it was bizarre to me that in Montreal, the women were in one set of housing and the men were elsewhere. You couldn't even, you didn't even know who the rest of your team was. And uh, you had, we had something called the women's administrator. What the heck is that? Um, and, and by the way, in 1980, when I was being bad, um, they offered me the chance to be the women's administrator for the US team at, at uh, Lake Placid so that I would stop training and stop worrying about being on the team. And I thought, nah, I'll just continue to be bad. Um, you rabble rouse. Yeah, you. but uh, things like that because then you couldn't, you could never be the chef de mission because you were in the, you know, the women in one place. So the first thing we did was, um, okay, let's make sure that the team decides where people live. We won't have a segregated village. We'll have teams together here in Los Angeles, and that was the first time that the team was together. And I said, we don't care who's in what room. That's up to their team. Um, we'll give them enough beds and they can figure it out. Uh, so, and that meant that a woman or a man could be chef de mission. So it, it, it's looking at things that were wrong and figuring out how to make it right. And we, are, we have moved light years. And the nice thing is if you get people to understand you're just doing what's right and what's important. The, the, the Olympic movement as it sports in this country is built on volunteers. We don't have enough volunteers. And without the volunteers, you don't have youth sport. We need more volunteers for youth sport and for sport. So we need to tap the great untapped resource, which is women. It's all logical. It's a way. It's, if I can ask one of my students uh, to stand up here, this is Kim Yoshikuyi right here. Kim is uh, going with me to the Sochi Games. She'll be a credential journalist in Sochi as well. Uh, Kim, uh, Anita has just identified one of the main principles of our class. Why don't you identify it, Kim? Basic principle is moto. What did, what did she just What did she just say? Master of the obvious. Right. We 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 teach uh, in our class being a master of the obvious, just like Anita said. Right. Right. Hey, you want to? So now, um, uh, along with uh, the sport, uh, no Olympics is just a sports festival. There's always the arts festival, and I think this is a question for you in particular, Barry. The Los Angeles, the, the arts festival that accompanied the 1984 games is very memorable. If you could talk about that, please. The, I think art, an art, a cultural festival, it's actually the term in the charter is a cultural festival, uh, has been required for many, many decades. And up until 1928, I believe they gave medals for it. Uh, we, but even though it was required, leading up to the 84 games, it was very much a sort of sideshow, ancillary thing, done just to check the box. The 84 uh, Arts Festival was a very big part of what the organizing committee did. Uh, Bob Fitzpatrick, who was the president of Cal Arts, and his two, two lieutenants, um, who were Hope Chopik and Peter Schneider, uh, put together a, a festival that's had an impact. We're talking about legacy today. as a legacy in this town ever since. It really changed this town. Uh, the, the, it changed it in particular because you can reflect on what that festival was. The heart and soul of it, not 100% of it, but most of it, was bringing companies 
dance companies, opera companies. Covent Garden had never been to America before. Uh, the uh, Sankajuku from Japan, uh, the uh, Kodo drummers from Japan, uh, companies, an uh, opera company, uh, no, a dance, a Shakespeare company from Australia. Uh, there, most of that art festival was bringing to the benighted people of Los Angeles in this provincial burg uh, great artists from around the world. We did a festival, an art festival, um, around Wagner's Ring uh, three years ago here in Los Angeles that instead of bring, having to bring companies from around the world, we were able to have 122 organizations come together in the same model as that 84 festival and do a festival entirely companies here in the city. Bring people from around the world to see what Los Angeles had. In 84, we had to bring the world to Los Angeles so Angelinos could see something like that. That 180 degree shift is a legacy of the 84 games. It was followed two years after the games by another festival that Bob Fitzpatrick put on and then two more iterations of that through 1993. Uh, but even the Gettys thing last year, Pacific Standard Time, was something built on the idea of cooperation out of the silos across different organizations within the city to showcase what we have so that the 84 festival is the only thing that could have made us able to do that. In fact, our opera company is a direct result of the 84 games. It was founded in 1985, and Placido Domingo, who heads it today uh, as the uh, artistic director, he was in the Covent Garden cast that came in 84. So there's a particular institution that was founded because of it. But the practice in Los Angeles of having widespread, top quality, as they like to say, world-class arts organizations. It wasn't true before then, and it's true now. I, uh, I remember the fact that the IOC, um, primarily Monique Yu, who was the IOC then, mm -hmm. uh, was perplexed at why we were bringing all these international groups to Los Angeles. That's right. and because it was supposed mm -hmm. to be a cultural festival of explaining to the the people who came to the games what the culture was of Los Angeles. So what was the problem there? That's right. We, <laughs> we had to do it. We didn't have it. But now we have it. Yeah. And that was the impetus, the major legacy. And this is what I'm talking about, about how it has really transformed Los Angeles and, and thrust us into the 21st century as long ago as 1984. Yeah. That's right. I mean, Mark mentioned how many, I don't know, somebody was saying 13 museums or something. Yeah, if you start just thinking about, maybe you're saying it, Tom. 14, but it 14. Is, uh, if, you, if you just start thinking about the museums you go to and ask, was that one here in 84? Or even if it was here, like LACMA, it wasn't then what it is today. But the Norton Simon and the Getty and the, and <coughs> and the Hammer and just long lists. This is a totally different place, but that was the impetus. So my friends were right about worrying about me coming to this cultural wasteland. <laughs> they were right. <laughs> they were right. So we, um, we have a little ways to go yet, but uh, I've already considered this a success because we've gone an hour without talking about money. So um, now, um, for those of, some of you already know the, how the finances in our country work, but for those of you who don't, I'm going to give you a little primer, and I apologize for this. In every other country around the world, the Olympic movement is a function of the federal government. In our country, it is not. The United States Olympic Committee, again by dint of the 1978 Amateur Sports Act, requires that the United States Olympic Committee be self-sustaining. What does that mean? That means that the USOC must raise its own money all by itself. So the team that marches in Sochi in 10 days is, is self-sustaining. That's why you see all the ads for Visa and McDonald's and Coke and everything like that. Does everyone understand? It has to raise every cent itself. Okay, so the Los Angeles games were the first games in our country after that 1978 law. Okay, so this was very complex, very complicated, as Mark had explained, and nobody was really quite sure how this was going to work. So, <clears throat> as Barry has explained, the ABC television deal enabled the LAOOC to have enough breathing room <clears throat> excuse me, to get things going. And then Peter totally revolutionized the entire world of Olympic finance by giving exclusive rights to various companies. 
All this totally makes sense also? Okay. Ultimately, to cut a very long story short, the LAOC made a profit. How much was the profit, or in Olympic terms, the surplus? It was $232.5 million. I'll say it again, $232.5 million. Okay, so Southern California's share of that money is this. It's this. Now, Anita, I'll turn to you first. Can you describe in broad terms the work of LE84 and its future direction? Yes. Would you please? <laughs> I'd love to. Yeah, we uh, received $93 million. The numbers will not add up for a couple of reasons. One, they just don't. Uh, secondly, uh, there was a, a, a liquidating trust afterwards, and the liquidating trust actually made money. That was to end all the, the lawsuits and anything left over from the games, and it actually was, it wound up with more money than it started with. Um, and, um, and the USOC received money from the COIN Act. As soon as the games were over, the USOC received all the money from the COIN Act. Not a penny came back because the COIN Act was to support the production of the games and the USOC. So the numbers will never add up. Oh, well, the USOC and the Los Angeles Organizing Committee split the surplus. 60%. 40 percent here, 60 percent to the USOC. And the USOC, the deal was that they would split it for 40% would stay with the USOC and 20% would go to all of the national governing bodies, both winter and summer. So some people like to say it was 40, 40, 20, but it was what it was. David Wolper hated the fact that he didn't negotiate 50, 50, uh, but it was 40, 60. Um, so we received the $93 million, not all at once, but by the year 1991, I believe we received everything we would receive. We make grants to sports organization. That's the first thing we did. Our second thing we did was to create a coaching program. So we created a program to teach people how to coach. The third thing we did was have this facility built, uh, which has the best sports library in the universe next door. For real. Uh -huh. and, uh, and it's in the process of being digitized so that people can utilize the resources 24-7 throughout the world. Then we began to also undertake research and put on events here once this facility was built. So we make grants to youth sports organizations and through that process we help with technical uh, advice or technical, like uh, technical information, technical assistance. assistance, thank you. That's Patrick Escobar, who's Vice President for Grants and Programs here. And uh, while well, I'm at it, be behind him is, is, is Michael Salmon, who's part of the library staff, and to his right is Shirley Ito, who's also part of the Do I have, does everyone, have I introduced everyone? Anyway, uh, so we have reached more than three million kids. We have reached more than 70,000 people have taken our coaching programs. We have uh, spent, uh, $220 million out of that 93 we received. Magic finances. Uh, and our, led, our, our endowment now is about $150 million. Uh, and we uh, continue to undertake research and we in, invite you to look at our website because we're, we put a lot of information on the website. For example, we did uh, a study on why women uh, were having this ep epidemic of ACL injuries. Guess what? Uh, the warm-ups done were done for men. Men's bodies are slightly different from women's, well, a lot different from women's bodies, but in the structure of the knee, the muscles that support the knee are different and need to be warmed up slightly differently. So the study which was done by uh, the chief medical officer for USA Soccer led the, led, led the study for us. Just doing different warm-ups strengthens the muscles and had a 97% reduction in the incidence of ACL injuries. That study is also on our website. So we're able to do uh, do certain things. Uh, I, I failed to introduce one member. It's because he's only been here for four months, five months, and that's Bob Wagner. Sorry, Bob. <laughs> I've looked at him several times, and uh, sorry about that. Um, uh, thank you, Shirley. <laughs> the, the impact of the, of the uh, LA84 Foundation in this city and young people, when I say city, I actually mean the region has been enormous. The Williams sisters playing tennis, that's an impact of the 84 Foundation. That, they got their start. 
Uh, the Recreation and Parks Department, about which I'm quite familiar in Los Angeles, is very grateful always to annual gifts and also special episodic gifts from LA84 Foundation. One of them, the annual one, is something that I hope will always be annual that allows us to do our summer swim training programs in the swimming pools across the city. Uh, but we've also had their support on all sorts of special things, skate parks and, and futbolito fields and important things. If you know you've got something really important that infects kids, you can turn here and they will give it a very considered eye and an impact. But let me say a few words about the money um, because people are understandably interested. And in the Olympic movement, and somewhat sometimes to our harm in terms of reputation, there seems to be this take that this is the games that commercialize the games and oh yeah, it's sort, of, it's sort of sniffing about that, that oh those Americans, they're always so greedy and well of course they made money, it's not significant, but they commercialized the games. Alan was right earlier when he said that the reason we got bigger numbers, and I mentioned how much bigger our number for the very first deal was with Coca-Cola, is because of exclusivity. Moscow had many more sponsors and licensees, 100 more than we did. More commercial, not less. Montreal, all similarly, over 100 more. More commercial, not less. You could make more money, multiples, ended up with about $130 million from sponsorship and licensing, instead of $6 million, uh, by giving exclusivity. So by reducing the number of sponsors down to about 30, not a couple hundred, or 150, we both reduced the commercialism and increased the revenue. So that when you look at legacies within the Olympic movement, people have said broadly that the entire Olympic movement, in a sense, is a legacy of 84, because it could have gone defunct if it weren't for this saving moment. But also the way they do things is different. They learned that there's money in them, their hills, from the TV they were always doing. We didn't invent the idea of televising the games and commercialize it. They'd been doing TV at the games since Squaw Valley they, in 1960. But they weren't charging enough. So after, and they've been doing sponsorships, many more of them, but they weren't charging enough and they weren't doing it right. They looked at what we did here and starting shortly thereafter, the IOC, instead of each individual city, took over the television negotiations and their numbers have gone up even in, 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 uh, in um, uh, 1984 dollars. So they're actually charging more for TV even in, in constant dollars than we ever did. And similarly, they're charging much more. They have what's called the top program where the IOC, rather than the individual city, uh, does the major sponsorships. And they, there again, are getting bigger numbers than we did. So if the measure of commercialism is how much you get, they're now more commercial than they were. But in truth, that's not the measure. The measure is whether the city is plastered with signs and so on, and we weren't. Uh, so that's why the numbers were so high. Costs were kept low. It wasn't just increasing revenue. By using existing facilities, we have this wealth of existing facilities. We only had to build three permanent facilities. And frankly, were we to do the games again here, we could do it without building any permanent facilities. Oh, we'll get there. Hang on. But, but we'll the, get there. the, the other thing about the money and the $10 million, the the $10 million yeah. that was set aside for litigation is that we had no litigation. Uh, all the contracts we did had arbitration clauses. We had one litigation during the games, a case we brought to try to send out a signal to people who would pirate merchandise, letting them know that we'll confiscate it. And we prevailed in that. And then after the games, there were a dozen or so arbitrations. And they were all decided in our favor. And that's why the 10 million that was set aside could be returned back to the committee with interest. Good lawyer. David. Hold on, David first, and then Anita, and then well, that's all right. um, Just a, a quick story on how the money was developed so that there was a surplus in the first place. Um, among Peter Ubras, many creative ideas, one was how to get the facilities built that we didn't have in existence. And there were three that we needed to get built, uh, a shooting range, a velodrome for cycling, and the a swim stadium that now is at USC. And the thinking going in before Peter was hired was, well, we'll raise money from these different sources and use that money to build these few facilities. Uh, it was Peter's idea to say, no, we will get a corporation to build the facility. They'll give us the money and build it for us in exchange for our putting the name on that facility for the long term. And this was really the beginning of naming rights, which before that had not existed, but no one called it that at the time. 
And so we got uh, McDonald's to put its name on the swim stadium. It's still there at USC. 7-Eleven was the sponsor of the velodrome. Well, the velodrome story uh, was interesting because the deal was negotiated at a level lower than Peter Ubroth, but the final meeting was between Peter Ubroth and the CEO of 7-Eleven, who, whose headquarters at the time were in Texas. And Peter, on an appointed day, flew down to Texas, walked into the CEO, CEO's office, and went into full sales pitch, as was his norm, and talked about how, and Peter was a master at this, and, and talked about how this was going to be the first velodrome west of the, of the Mississippi, this, or west of the Rockies. It was going to be the finest velodrome in the United States. Athletes would come from all over the world to train there. And the CEO held up his hand at one point, and he said, in a Texas accent I cannot imitate, said, Peter, I want you to know, you're going to get your $4 million, but I've got a question. Peter said, what's that? He said, what the Sam Hill is a velodrome? 